press the bell icon on youtube and don't miss another update everybody knows you as an author of um, uh, you've written on leela helen everything and uh, m in the big home that's a very very popular work but i don't know how many people are aware that you're also a children's book author so i was wondering is that something yes <laughs> was that the Hello. first book <laughs> yeah that was actually the first book for children a bear for felicia okay yeah okay yeah no i know there are loads of them how many are there actually <laughs> yeah quite a few actually okay hmm. and huh. okay so yeah, basically you know <laughs> i um, i've been a teacher all my life really actually okay uh, so i've been i mean i started teaching at the age of 14 really you know when i uh, went to college and i realized that you need money in order to do it. you have a life you have a, yeah. a, a secondary life and you already actually also to buy books right um so i started teaching mathematics and from that point in time i realized that you know children respond very well to something like a story so i remember i was teaching um uh, teaching chemistry for the first time now it's teaching to a little kid uh, who enjoyed dancing and who strangely enough enjoyed ballroom dancing he was uh, he was about 12 years old and he enjoyed ballroom dancing so i taught him um, chemical equations as like you know the positive the positive a uh, part of the of sodium nacl na plus cl break up and they yeah. spin across and na is grabbed by so4 but so4 needs two partners to dance so it becomes na2so4 and they spin together and i could see that as soon as you started telling a story the way children responded to learning became very different okay so whatever you did as long as you were you know like you started by telling them something else you started by talking about leonardo da vinci or you started by talking about uh, um uh mikel angelo whatever they began to respond as if uh, they weren't learning but they were listening to a story and they relaxed a lot so how that there was huge power in the telling of stories and at that point i used it of course just to teach because i was i was a tutor making my living as a tutor and then i became a journalist and discovered that there was power in the printed word you know you reach so many yeah. more people there was a time and then one day these two things combined together and of course up to that time i just saw myself as an adult right i didn't see myself as a writer for children i mean because they're terrifying children are terrifying as an audience um if they don't like what you're doing they just stop this they just don't care you know and there's no dikhava it's not like yeah. you know sometimes you will you or i will read a book because it won the nobel prize the author won the nobel prize so you just plow through a book that is boring you because or you've heard that uh, uh so and so author is really like everybody's reading him right now yeah, so you're not reading this all right there's there's no pretense there yeah Uh, so you can see it when you're doing readings for children. Also, they look at you, and if you're catching them, they're totally absorbed. And the moment you lose them, they're completely lost. They just wander. But I was at a uh, a friend of mine was telling me about her about her teddy bear, uh, and um, her mother had been ill for a long time, and so they had put her into care. This was in England, and in England, you know, when you put your parent into care, you have to spend a lot of time. Uh, and so they were clearing out her house with this. she would not never come back to her house and they found their teddy bear which they were which you know they played with as children and the grandchild of the family one of the uh, said i'd like the teddy bear his father said no i think it can be sold for quite a little quite a bit of money and that will help grandma so we're going to sell this bear on the internet and she said i sold the bear for 8000 pounds Wow. And you know, in India, mm-hmm. as soon as you hear a foreign currency, you begin to calculate <laughs> how many rupees yeah. is that, how many rupees is that. So I calculated, and I thought, oh my God, a teddy bear costs like lakhs of rupees. And from that moment, and I had teddy bears when I was growing up. Teddy bear was such a large amount of money. I immediately began to calculate how much money it was, and realized that it was lakhs of rupees that the teddy bear cost. So I thought. Uh, what if someone had thought uh you know jerry has a teddy bear and it could bring a lot of money and that money could be used for his education and i felt cold because i grew up very close to the to my teddy bears and i knew that the only way i could deal with this terror was to exorcise it by writing it down so i wrote the story and i since writing it this teddy bear 
take on a kind of life. He he wasn't a standard issue teddy bear. He was a gender shifting teddy bear. And the reason why he was a gender shifting teddy bear was because I often think uh, in children's stories there's far too much made about being bo- a boy or being a girl. Yeah. And even when you're trying not to, you know, to do that, you're still making a big big noise about it. You know, you'll do say the boy who liked to wear nail polish and the, the clear uh, this thing is all right to wear nail polish. And there's still something a little children can smell. I think the it's a little uh, preachy, the, the yeah. Form. Yeah. Okay. So because they also know that society doesn't think it's alright for a boy to wear nail polish. We have to get society to the point where they think it's alright. It's not the kids who have a problem. Anyway. So uh, I was I was writing this thing and I thought it'd be nice if the teddy bear can be a boy for one owner and a girl for one. You know. And so that teddy bear is willing to be who you want him to be or her to be. Yeah. So I, you know, the story began to grow. And finally, when I finished writing it, I edited it. I sent it to Ravi Singh, my publisher, who was then at, Pen- at uh, Penguin, as I send him everything that I do. And he said, yeah, it's a great book for children. I thought, really? Okay. <laughs> he said, do you mind if Puffin does it? So I thought, no, I don't mind as long as it becomes a book. I'm quite happy. Puffin did some lovely illustrations after I gave them hell, I must say. And then finally it came out. But you know the funny thing about it? A Bear for Felicia's largest audience is young women who carry it about in their handbags, who read it repeatedly and write to me and say, it's such a lovely story, thank you for it. And that's another lesson, you know, Anuradha, about how you can never predict what your book is going to be. So it's a children's book that is read by children and non-children alike and I'm quite happy to do it. No, I think uh, there are a lot of adults also. uh, There are a lot of adults also who read picture books. Hey, I I love reading (laughs) children. You know, I grew up at a time when uh, when my school library. I went to a school Mm. in Mahim, which was decent school, but they they didn't think much about like a library being necessary. So the school library was about books kept in the in the school library cupboard in the in the school classroom cupboard, and you had to you access those books. Then we had circulating libraries. In Bombay, we had what were called circulating libraries, where you could go and get books, you know, hire Archie Comics and Phantom yeah. Comics and, <laughs> and uh, you know, P.G. Woodhouse and whatnot. But there was, I discovered Puffin books, you know, at the age of 20 when I started buying secondhand books. So then I suddenly read Charlotte's Web when I was 25 and I fell in love. Yeah. I started reading the Saturdays by Elizabeth Enright. I read the Narnia series. I read the Moomin series, all as an adult. And I think when today, uh, we were younger, probably you just had those Russian books and some. Uh, ah, Black the Russian books. Yeah, my God, <laughs> how many Russian books I had! Which yeah. and Misha jumped on the back of the of the wolf and grabbed its mane, and the wolf jumped over seven countries. Great, beautiful <laughs> illustrations. Yeah, beautiful, yeah. But the stories were pretty awful. I have to say, <laughs> but I loved them. Their time also. Yeah, that's. Those books were one. Um, so, you know, at one point I was thinking about the rise of intolerance in the country and you know, the fact that um, uh, it seemed as if the students I was meeting uh, all lived in silos. So there was the Hindu silo, there was the Muslim silo, there was the Christian silo. There wasn't much interaction between them. And I began to think about how do I talk about it's right to be different. Without actually, you know, one of the things about children's fiction is that they wave a finger at the child. So you must be like that. Mm. And I remember when I used to read them, I'd read those books, but I really ended up feeling very cheesed off by them. I didn't like them. Right? So uh, I wanted to. And then I hit upon the idea of the fable. So I did, uh, when it was our wife, it's extremely talented. Uh, uh, What's it called? Uh, sorry, illustrator called it? Garima Gupta, hmm. and it is about a, a, a crow called Savri. And Savri's problem is that she has a dream, and her baby is going to be born white. Now, as a what's crow, the, uh, sorry, what's the uh, name of the book again? Uh, when crows are white. Okay. It's a scholastic book. Okay. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I uh, I was really 
taken by that idea because what happens when there's a white crow is the other crows peck it to death. If there's a crow with any difference. So Savri begins to ask that question. Why do we do this? And then, you know, the, again, the story began to unfold itself because I started reading about crows. I started reading about asking people about mythology and crows. What what do they say in your, your faith, in your tradition? What do they say about crows? And various answers, Antaryami, the messenger from the other side, uh, Abshagun, uh, or, you know, good omen. Good omen on certain days, bad omen on certain days, good omen in certain situations, bad omen. It just fascinated me how much of a response. And of course, the fact that, you know, they're such intelligent birds. And in a yeah. city, you just can't avoid them. I mean, you know, they're there all the time and they're beautiful also. That's I remember RK Lakshman's beautiful illustration, beautiful drawings of them. So all these came together and made that book. So often I think, you know, what happens is that there's sometimes an intention to write a book but often it's about the intersection between your own reading between your own writing between your own living that produces the material for the book. that's where it comes from so almost everything that i have written has come out of that you know that intersection yeah, yeah. you also wrote uh, one for tulika recently right uh, anya and her baby yes, brother indeed. Anya special, and her baby special brother. okay huh? children, yeah. Huh? yeah yeah okay that that was really a moment you know um, it came that I was sitting in a in a doctor's clinic in the days when you went to doctor's clinics, <laughs> and there was a yeah. family there, and the family did obviously what was a special needs baby on their lap, and there was a little girl who was about five years old or six years old. She must have been reading a book, and she was very lonely. And the family's attention, father and mother, were completely focused on that child, on the on the little baby with the special yeah. needs. And I wanted to reach out to her and say, "They love you. Your parents really love you." But right now they have all this this problem on their hands and that's why they're focused there. And then I thought, I grew up in a family like this where the focus was on someone with a problem, yeah. my mother. And uh, I would not have liked it if someone pointed this out to me. I would not have. I don't want you talking about my family. So I didn't say anything to that little girl. When I came home and I was telling my sister this, my sister said, why didn't you just say, what a pretty dress you have on? And I thought, yeah. I could have just validated her in mm. some other way. I could have just talked to her. I didn't have to make a big thing about, oh, your family loves you, but uh, yeah, I just, just noticed so her. so bad yeah. because, <laughs> yeah, because, you yeah. know, you try to do the big thing and you, you avoid the little thing. Yeah. So then out of that point came this, this, uh, this story. How do you talk to a, a child whose brother or whose sibling has special needs? How, yeah. What would you say? started writing the story and then Tulika very sweetly agreed to, to publish it and uh, Anya and her baby brother is out there and I hope that when the lockdown tries phases <laughs> people will buy the book and yeah. see it and like it or respond to it in various No, I think uh, these themes, it's great to talk about these themes in children's books which I think is being done now even in India Yes, now, very much no? Like I really think children are really lucky they've got such lovely books Tulika, Pratham, all these people yeah. are doing really fascinating books and they don't want to read kids. Hmm. <laughs> they just want to play on telephones. <laughs> What's with the you, You've got all these great books that you're all doing and you want telephones. I think the parents, that, I think, reading, are, the parents are reading their books. Parents, yeah. yeah, probably. I hope so. Someone yeah. should be. Yeah. Tickle Me, Don't Tickle Me as a collection of poetry came out of like, uh, you know, the idea that we just... Uh, the original idea was that uh, Ruskin Bond and I would both write a series of nursery rhymes. Okay. Okay, and uh, we put them together as a book. You know. And then uh, all the nursery rhymes that I was writing were very moralistic. You know, so I wrote one about a coconut tree that stands in salty water, but this coconut water is sweet, and how you can be. You know, like it's almost everything okay, is like, yeah, yeah. I with, like a, with a moral, know, moral in the end. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the poetry I did not like. Yeah. I like poetry that that went rubbity tubbity tubbity tum. Yeah, yeah. I like poetry that you know that, that was fun and mad and bizarre. Yeah. Why yeah. was I writing poetry that was all about uh, you know like lecturing to little kids? So I just gave up the idea. I said I can't do it. I see it ends, I think. But you know, a seed has been planted, and you're already thinking about like yeah. poetry. And little things would happen. Like I remember. Uh, 
I was typing and the word question turned up. I was typing question and question turned up. And I thought question, that's a lovely word. Why isn't it a word? Yeah, and so I then I wrote a poem hmm. yeah, called a question. You know, uh, I'll read that perhaps now. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hang a question from a string under a blue moon. Now you have a magic thing, your personal quest too. I'm really hoping that parents will tell, or you know, teachers will say, draw a quest too now. You know? <laughs> yeah. And let's see what it looks like. It would be yeah. really nice. We, I did a book for for Duckbill Books called Monster Guard, which yeah, was I, about I, with, uh, with monsters. The, yeah. With Priya Korean. Yeah. 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 Huh. Yeah, Priya Korean. Lovely yeah. illustrations by Priya, Priya yeah. Korean. Uh, so the idea was like, you know, when I was growing up, the teachers always wanted you to draw inside the lines, to color inside the lines. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So I think that's a way of trying to train your hand or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I could not color inside the lines. I colored outside mm -hmm. everywhere. I colored my face, I colored my my shirt, <laughs> I colored everything. Huh. I put water inside the lines. So I thought I will draw I will do a drawing book where children can use color and then put circles around it and say that's a monster. Okay. And a monster can be any shape. Yeah, monster it can, can be, be it doesn't shape. have to yeah and it can yeah. spill also. Monsters should yeah. spill. Yeah. Easy bits that fall off them. Mm. So I did Monster Garden out of that uh, mm. that impulse. And then that same impulse was uh, was behind this poem, which is called More Ink. My pen is full of inky ink. I'm going to have a thinky think. Think up something bright. I'll sit me down and writey write. But I may need more ink because so much ends up on my balls. So it's, you know, the, the impulse to write a poem is one of those really strange things because uh, have you noticed, Anuradha, if you say I can sing, everyone says sing, please sing. And you say I write poetry, everyone says, yeah, I read poetry when I was a child, but I, mean, I was in college, I don't read yeah. it now. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm hoping that poetry for children will bring back rhythm, will be, bring back the fascination with language, will back, bring back the fascination with, uh, with, with just music in language. Because often the, the prescribed texts that children read are in rhythms that are not ours. They are in rhythms that are, or they are selected, those passages are selected more for their accuracy of language, or for grammar, or yeah. style, you know, rather than it's for just all, building uh, knowledge, and enjoying knowledge and, It's all knowledge and oh, learning. Oh, yeah. oh yes, knowledge and it's learning not, it's not is fun. a very big yeah. Hmm. yeah, so I think this is a book of fun poems. And I'm yeah. hoping that kids will enjoy the fun. Yeah, I like that one, which you said, that's a true uh, incident, right? Where uh, yeah, this yeah. person, he trained... Uh, Snake ah, behind yeah. him, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah to walk fun. beside. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's just crazy, really. Yeah, and actually, it's like I mean, I was, uh, and that's another a good point. That's another place where, like, the book where a poem can start. You're reading mm. something, you think, really, you trained a, a snake to walk at your heels. Why mm. would you do that? Yeah, why would like, you, you do know, that? Actually, <laughs> a dog will happily walk at your heels. Yeah. You snake. But hey, the world is full of people who want to do really peculiar things. Hmm. Maybe Hal Sloan would say, why do you want to write a book? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, somebody Select might say that. Instead. Go around the world and pick up stuff. Yeah. yeah. So is it satisfying then, writing for children? I mean, when you read to them, when you have your the feedback that you get. Um, I mean, how is it being writing for it children and that versus writing really for mixed. them? Like sometimes it's great fun. I've discovered that, you know, what you have to do with, with kids is that you don't read to them, but you read with them. Mm. Okay. So yeah. if you can let them make a lot of noise, let them bounce around. And mm. you can, like, after every reading, I make everyone stand up and throw a tantrum. Okay. <laughs> so like you have to throw a proper tantrum, shouting and shouting and, and screaming and, you know, behaving as badly as possible. Nobody gives children, like whenever children are taken outside the home, I think parents tell them, you have to behave yourself. Not like that. Because now people will think I'm a bad player. So you have to really don't, don't do like that. So now I, suddenly an adult is there saying, now you have to throw a huge tantrum and scream and shout and tell dad. And of course the tantrum is, you have to tell daddy and mommy to buy this book for you. Okay. <laughs> that's smart. <laughs> that's evil. Yeah, evil. that's yes, yeah. So, 
<laughs> it's quite evil also. <laughs> After that shouting and screaming has happened, they are your best friends in life. Okay? Yeah. And but I don't do that at the beginning. I do it at the end. Because you're and one of them. Like, then. For instance, yeah. yeah. So there's a point at which also there's a poem about breakfast. So hmm. it's a rhyming poem. So it's like uh, no samosa, make my na, and everyone has said dosa. <laughs> and when they get it, they yeah. are so delighted. Okay, like I was saying. Uh, Oh, I'm Tidly. I want an Idli, and everyone shouts Idli. And they just love it. But you have to be careful. Like, oh ye, it's oh he. Oh he is Maharashtra. Hmm. When you do it in Hyderabad, people just don't get. Like, they don't know what yeah. rhymes yeah. Hey, that you can eat for breakfast. But most of the time, it just you know, it's children. Are, I think um, the school and the uh, tries to turn children into receptacles, into little like pots which have to be filled up and sent. You pour in the algebra, pour in the geometry, pour in physics, chemistry, Hindi, Marathi, English, whatever, and send yeah. the child. Home. And no child is asked to come with a question. Like, do you have a question? What do you want to know? It's what we would like you to know. So kids come for readings also like read receptacles. They're just like, yeah. ah, now tell us. When they're told that they have to do something and they are, can be part of it, they just love it. So that and I think, I think uh, early after, um, in the early years, younger kids are filled with questions. They have so many questions. Oh yeah, about everything. Oh, this yeah. is it. Mm. Up to the age of three, take a kid for a walk in a park, and you can't stop the questions. Yeah. What is that? That's grass. Why is it grass? Because you know cows eat it. Why do mm. cows eat it? Isn't it dirty? Why does a cow put its mouth in the mud? Hundreds of questions. You take send that kid to school, and after that, there are no more questions. School mm-hmm. seems to be the way to kill the kids' curiosity. Yeah. Plus that, I don't understand how. Because I think what you're doing is the gender is set by the adults. Whereas in the walk in the park with the baby, the baby is setting the agenda. The child is setting the agenda, asking you the question that they want to ask. I wonder if like schools could just do that one tweak, which is send the teacher in and let the let the kids talk, and see whether that works. So I think yeah. even with reading, <laughs> if we just Change the agenda a bit. Not now. I'm going to tell you a story, and now this is the story. And now you must all sit quietly and listen. That sounds very much like class. Like class. Sounds yeah. very much like school. And that's not how you're going to convince children that reading is fun. Yeah. So maybe so fun. you're saying we should have storytelling sessions in schools. Yeah, but uh, not reading, just storytelling. Yeah. But again, storytelling is like you know one person mm. saying once upon a time there was a lovely princess and she told yeah. her blah blah blah. blah. Which is fine. Mm-hmm. I don't have any problems with that. But what about once upon a time there was a lovely? What do you want? And someone might say worm. Mm-hmm. If the kid says worm, then you have to tell a worm story. You know, mm-hmm. you have to learn. Yeah, have, yeah. If they could be, if they could participate in the process of making the story, the entire mm-hmm. exercise would not be. First, it would not be adult centered. It would be child centered and child. And second, it would be everybody's imagination working together, and that's a great. That would be a great experience. Yeah. So that's the little learnings that I've done from the readings that I've done with children. That uh, if you, you know, if you want them to sit, they will, because these are middle class children. That yeah. they have gone to good schools. Their parents are in the background. Parents are watching off like, you know. But um, if you allow them to run wild, they will run wild, and the reading will become a much more. Wonderful, vibrant space, and wonderful, vibrant is what we want, no, for them. Of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you were saying that a lot of children are now busy on their phones, and unlike our generation when we didn't have these books. <coughs> so, um, uh, well, how do you think you can encourage kids to read? I mean, they're busy on their PlayStation. Very, right? very simple. Yeah. But unfortunately, this will sound like parent blaming again, and I don't want to blame yeah. parents. But here, here's the thing. Your your kid is a monkey. Monkey see, monkey do. So monkey is looking at you, and you are getting your all your joys and sorrows and excitements from that phone. You come home, you sit down, you you put on the phone, and you're swiping left, you're swiping right, you're laughing, you're talking. Kid wants in on that because she or he sees that this is what it means to have fun. If you came home and read, then the child sit next to you and read. They pick up a book and read. Yeah, so you want to get as a reader. Yeah. yeah, you read. And if you can, when you are reading, put your arm around the kid and draw the kid into that circle of love, and read to the kid, and just see how much 
the kid will begin to associate reading with the warmth and love of your of your arm of your body and that positive reinforcement that is created will make a reader out of that child but it's up to you if you are going to play with your phone the kid is going to want to and don't mm. think you can buy one sastika phone and pass it off the kid wants kind of phone they want an iphone and they want the best one okay because that's but you can i still believe pass on a love of reading if you are a reader but don't expect the child magically to become a reader on its own because reading is good for good for the child you aren't doing 100 things that are good for you you don't exercise as much as you should for instance why do you think the child should do everything that's good for her or him you have to you have to understand that kids will do what they want to do now the secret is to try and make them want to read and to make them want to read is to demonstrate how much reading is a part of your life and then they'll pick it up naturally spontaneously automatically you don't have to worry about that yeah it has to be a fun activity it should be fun for them yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and therefore the books that you choose also can't be like the encyclopedia britannica you can't buy bring yeah. illustrated classics 50 times tales from jatak tales from ramayan from mm-hmm. mahabharat tales from the epic tales from our indian classics you don't like really they should want to read those books as well so therefore take the kid to the bookshop and let them have the the joy of retail as well let them choose their own books give a budget yeah and say you can take two of those because those are expensive or one or three of those because those are cheap let them make those decisions they'll get agency they feel control of the situation but if you go and say nahi we will take these two books plus these two books this is good teach yourself physics this is good improve your brain okay take this home now i mean they bring that home and they feel i want to watch television instead i don't yeah. want to read this book but they want to read buy a comic book let them let them read a comic book it's a, it's reading it's visual it and it's not as many words as i would like but still it's their choices and then you're respecting their choices also and giving them in on their own bookshelves i think yeah. that's important and after a while the books yeah the books won't be they won't be reading them anymore give them a way to underprivileged children give those books a way to libraries make sure you know like a book on your bookshelf that is not being read is a crime against the goddess of learning give it away where it will be read yeah make sure true. it moves on azad kar do usko <laughs> let the book go out and do its it has a dharma also that book and that dharma has to be read and by many people let it go yeah, yeah. many people say to me oh i have kept my books from my childhood right up to today and they think just it's some saintly thing it's not if you are still reading them it's lovely please keep yeah. them but if you are not reading them then give them to someone who will read let a book go mm. yeah no absolutely yeah. and uh, we were talking about you know different genres that kids want to read not just you know an encyclopedia or something so horror is something that kids love and they're really drawn yeah. to and i think parents are a little uh, hesitant about you know introducing them to that genre and you've written a contributed to that horror book as well right So, yeah 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 i see i think horror no yeah i'm not a, a big fan of slasher kind of horror like yeah i'm not a big fan of but like for instance lemony snicket yeah it has to be age appropriate of course yeah mm. yeah there has to be some i think parental control and you know your kid best yeah. so you you should be in charge of your kids reading i'm not about to come in and tell you what your kid should or should not If your kid stays up at night crying because of something they read or what not, that's going to be your issue to handle, not mine. So it's okay for me to say, oh, you know, the child should be free to read anything. My basic personal uh, feeling is like when you know, when I was, uh, I mean, maybe ten or something, I got Lady Chatterley's Lover from my father's bookshelf, and I sat and read it. Mm. And my father saw me and and said nothing. He didn't intervene. I read about. a page or so and i was so bored i put it down i just didn't you know i wasn't interested in it. and i went back and i was reading hardy boys in 10 you know and plunged into the book so i think i believe in not editing or censoring children's choices but i also believe that every parent is his 
is responsible for their children in a way that we as outsiders can never be responsible so i think you know your child best you know i think about it there was a lovely uh, in the puffin series i remember k web who was the great editor of the puffin series used to write for girls of 12 and sensitive boys okay as a and i thought wow this is a recognition that there is a certain kind of boy who is sensitive and it's a nice way to put it also yeah that he would that kind of boy would like this book hmm. and, and a boy thinking, would uh, i think boys would like to say that yes we are sensitive yeah you know, yeah probably. actually <laughs> I, they wouldn't yeah. mind as a, as opposed yeah. to you know weak or girly or yeah whatever. or reading a girl's book yeah correct yeah so I think that that was a lovely way of doing it very interesting way of doing it and I think we need more of those of those ways of doing it. so when people ask me can you suggest a book for a three year old or an eight year old I really am lost because I don't know what that eight year old's reading abilities are you know yeah some eight year olds read you know really interesting and exciting books. with no effort i have a friend who's 7 year old is only interested in the periodic table oh, meaning okay. he really okay. likes the periodic table and he wants to know where calcium fits with magnesium and where you know like uh, the noble metals are and what not now how do i uh, if i recommend it uh, a child's book to him i think it wouldn't work you know so yeah. every child is so in- independent i think you should take children to bookshops and let them discover their level say read that or oh, you like that book no not only the cover open the books look inside read it aloud to me can you read five lines okay you think you like what you hear fine let's buy that book because that's how you buy books no right. i buy books like that i don't buy books on the ba- basis of the back i don't buy books on the basis of the blurbs i buy books on the basis of a tasting menu Like I pick up the book and I open it and I start reading and if I think ah 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 something here something that's reaching out to me I buy the book if not I don't buy so I'm saying that's how we should allow children also to experience the world of books yeah and uh, the other thing uh, you know with the lockdown happening uh, it's uh, difficult to what do you say get access hey, to books can I do it my lockdown for Yes, of course, please. So I was just saying that you know children's books are not available online or on Kindle. So while that's a great ah. thing normally because you don't want to encourage, I mean, you want them to pick up a physical copy. Uh, but what are you, your views on this? Do you think children's books should be on Kindle or? See, I don't know. Uh, you know, the Kindle wale and the people who run Kindle, etc., etc., are not the kind of people who would give up any market that was viable. Hmm. You know what I mean? Any any e-books? So I, I mean, you know, like uh, Story Weaver does it. Prakash Bhosle does that. Yeah. Personally, I am yeah. agnostic about the medium. Hmm. I don't care where you read as long as you're reading. Okay. okay? I hmm. really think reading is the central thing about reading is what it does to your brain. Right. Not what is was happening outside. So whether it's a print book or reading on the computer, I don't care as long as you're reading because that's hmm. what will make your brain will improve your brain. so that's my central myth yeah a book is if a they book. are not yeah. on kindle i think they're stupid because you know people they should be put on kindle because kids need to read and yeah, increasingly like, it seems to be sorry no i'm saying even story so, weaver they do a wonderful job the pratham books they have a lot of yeah, books yeah yeah so yeah. i when you know story weaver came to me and said uh, we'd like to put the book up on uh, story, the stories up on on story yeah. weaver said, you know the kid is reading where he reads is not and, you know um anuradha if someone told you or me or not you perhaps me that um, you know we'd be talking like this on a phone yeah till you know 30 years ago when i was growing up i just laughed yeah if i used to laugh i remember i laughed yeah. at this <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea that this would be and yeah. any convergence we thought of was computer convergence. Yeah. We thought it would happen on the computer. We did yeah. not think it would happen on the phone. That mm-hmm. this would become such yes, an important absolutely. part of our lives. We cannot predict what these kids' lives are going to be like. How digitized, how virtual mm-hmm. they are going to be. And with the, in this moment especially, in this moment of the lockdown, more than ever, we are seeing how much we rely on technology these days. Yeah. Just to do the ordinary of course, things of, of life, course, like yeah. to source, uh, you know, 
uh, tomatoes and potatoes and whatnot. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's please a poem. It. It's a work yeah. in progress. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. a it's about the about the lockdown. Yeah. My home sweet home isn't large at all. I have to say it is very small. It's a one room in a chawl. Family members, even all, pa and ma and my two sisters were sometimes quite cute, but often blisters. And with this virus in the city, everyone's home, and that's a pity, because we do get a little cramped. Our spirits can get a little damp. But when I want some space, I look into the pages of a book, because ever since I met Rare Rabbit, I developed a reading habit. I with, went with Cinderella to the ball and howled at the moon with the blue jackal. And they kept the light on, so I could read Moeen and Blyton. With Rudyard Kipling, I lived through blizzards. With Harry Potter, I fought dark wizards. With Roald Dahl, I encountered witches. Gerald Durrell kept me in stitches. What can you do with a book? What can't you do with a book? I can dream up computers like Charles Babbage. I can learn from a farmer how to grow cabbage. I can join a space mission and go to Mars, or just fly there with my superpowers. I can hunt with lions. I can fly with bees. I can learn to cook from old recipes. And once books over, once it's been read, I can still find books inside my head. So I don't need a home that's big and grand, so long as a book is close to hand. At that's home, lovely. when my interest in book tapers, books tapers, I can always read the newspapers. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Then, Not preachy at all. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. The, you know, the idea was to say, you yeah. know, it doesn't matter because actually, you know, think about it. You open the newspaper and you're suddenly in another part of the country. God, would you like to recommend some books? Uh, you know, let's I've, say some books my, by Indian uh, authors. If or, or okay, okay. Any, Anushka any, any Ravi books. Shankar, for instance. Hmm. Anushka Ravi Shankar is one of my favorites. I think she's a very good writer. Uh, yeah. There's um, a writer called uh, Samhita Arni who yeah. writes, writes uh, very lovely hmm. uh, books hmm. for children. Yeah, Shabnam Minwala. Yeah, Payal Kapadia wrote about a bookworm, and I love that book as well. I think it lost the crossword prize uh, one year. Um, Oh, R. K. Narayan Swami and Friends, yes. very nice, really lovely book. Um, and you know, different from everything else he wrote. Uh, I can read Swami and Friends again and again. Um, who else? Yeah, I think that's about my uh, my top favorite list. And I think you know, if you uh, if you're a, a, a parent, what you ought to do is look at the imprint, like Duckbill Books, Pratham. Yes. Hmm. Tulika. If you're looking, you know, you walk into a bookshop and you say Tulika books. What Tulika books do you have? If they show you the Tulika books, you're going to get things like you'd never expect to see normally. Yeah. You know. So, and okay, if your bookshop doesn't have Tulika books and you ask for them repeatedly, they'll start stopping. Yeah, like the Gajapati, so, Kulapati. Gajapati yeah, Kulapati is yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. Really lovely. You know, sort yeah. of books which bring. the scents and sounds of other indias not just um, urban india into the living room and i think that's a wonderful place for, for all yeah. of us to be yeah? yeah okay thanks so much jerry huh? thank you anuradha this was a lovely conversation yeah yeah you'll enjoyed it yeah, yeah keep reading <laughs>